Hello, my name is Ingrid Schoen, and I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this webinar. And in my presentation, I will talk about how to support uh, young people in their school to work transitions in times of global crisis. And I will report findings from my recent research, including uh, a new project on COVID uh, use, the, the COVID use economic activity and mental health monitor, which just started on the 5th of November this year. COVID is, of course, the big factor in young people's lives today because every aspect of their lives has been affected, including the disruption of education, the infamous exam debacle, school closure, <clears throat> that all increase the uncertainty amongst young people about the future of their education and how they can continue with uh, the education they have started, for example, or how they can enter uh, relevant <clears throat> education uh, institutions. There has been a destruction of employment opportunities and career prospects with one in 10 of young people who were in employment losing their employment and um, generally the career prospects for the future also are lo looking very uncertain for young people. And of course there have been major effects on the health and well-being, particularly of those aged 16 to 24 year old. So it is no surprise that mental health, employment, income and education are the main worries amongst young people today, as for example established in the OECD survey amongst uh, um, 16 to 24 year olds. But even before the onset of the pandemic, the social and economic integration of young people was an ongoing challenge. There has, for example, been an increasing precarious and temporary employment conditions for young people, with young people being increasingly in contracts without unemployment insurance or paid leave, with rising levels of young people not in education, employment or training, as well as a worrying increase in mental health problems. And if we compare, for example, uh, the different age cohorts in the UK, we see that for the British cohort study born in 1970, when they were aged 18 in 1988, about 25% of them continued in full-time education, while 68% uh, were employed either with or without training, and 7% were out of uh, the labor force or need. Amongst the longitudinal study of young people in England, born between 1989 and 1990, when they were aged 18 in 2008, 45% uh, were in full-time education, while 40% uh, were in uh, paid uh, employment, either paid work and a small percentage in apprenticeships. But we see that there is this dramatic increase of young people out of the labor force or being need. If you look at the UK household longitudinal study, 18 year olds, 18 to 19 year olds in 2018-19, we find that 49% uh, are in full-time education, but that the rest of the young people or the other half, 50% uh, of young people try to find uh, their way into the labor market and make it via the labor market, either in paid employment, and we find a very small percentage who are in apprenticeships. And we can also see that the amount of those who are need is still quite high. And if we then look at the youth unemployment rates uh, between 1975 to uh, 2020, we can see that um, youth, uh, young people are in particular affected by uh, the economic boom and bust of their times, like here, the recession of the 1980s, and also here, the two aftermath of the 2008 recession. We see that in particular, the 16 to 70 year olds are uh, most strongly affected by uh, the economic downturn, and they are most likely to experience unemployment, i.e. being uh, last in and first out and having the least experience to be competitive in the labor market. 
but also amongst um, 18 to 24 year olds, we can see that uh, they are about three times more likely to be unemployed than older workers aged 25 to 49 year olds. And here in interpreting this graph, one also has to consider that in 2013, uh, the minimum participation aid in education has uh, raised to 17 and in 2015 it was raised to 18. But you still see that uh, after that there is quite a considerable number of young 16 to 17 year olds who are actually unemployed or out of uh, the labor force who, who are not in education. And here you can also see that um, there, um, uh, well, there are still high levels of unemployed amongst, amongst those who are 18 to 24, despite the increase of the participation age. And here we can see this increase following the COVID in youth unemployment rates. And if you learn from previous uh, recessions, we we can expect that these uh, trends will um, uh, increase and become even worse in the years to come following the recession and economic decline following the COVID crisis, but also <laughs> the Brexit uh, situation. If you then look at the mental health among young adults uh, aged 16 to 34, using the UK household uh, longitudinal study, uh, I can report findings we did in collaboration with Terry Garnier, where we looked, uh, where we found, for example, that uh, those aged uh, 16 to 24 were most affected in particularly um, women aged 16 to 24. They show the highest level of um, mental health problems as uh, recorded by a mean score in the general health questionnaire which was used continuously in the UK HLS. So it is the young uh, women aged 16 to 24 who were most affected. And we can also see that uh, while the trends in mental health problems were quite stable between 2012 and uh, 2016 and 17, there had been an increase as a consequence maybe of the Brexit vote, both for uh, males and <clears throat> females, and also amongst those who were uh, uh, 25 to 34. So I think this current period is quite challenging for young people. And um, we, we then checked also who is most at risk. And in accordance with other studies, we found that unemployment is, risk is highest amongst young females, i.e. females aged uh, 16 to 24, about ethnic minority use, and young people from disadvantaged family background, i.e. low income and also education, and young people from the north of England. Regarding mental health, we also see that females are more at risk, making them really uh, the most um, uh, important uh, group for interventions, trying to improve both employment prospects and mental health. And then we also split down the uh, sample of young people, which is quite a heterogeneous sample, and we differentiated between those who were 16 to uh, uh, 18 year olds, the 19 to 21 year olds, and the 22 to 24 year olds. And of those groups, it, it was in particular the 22 to 24 year olds who were most at risk of uh, reporting mental health problems, um, i.e. it is those young people who are, who are about uh, to enter the labor market who are most concerned uh, about their mental health. And also we found that own economic activity was in particularly uh, associated with mental health problems that uh, compared to those who were either working or in full-time education, those who were out of the labor force or need had the highest levels of mental health problems, highlighting really that uh, employment is a key developmental task for young people that uh, 
the half of the population of uh, young British people in the U in England or in Great Britain actually want to enter the labor market after uh, they are aged um, 16, 17 or 18 and try to make their way into the labor market, highlighting really that employment is a key aspect of young people's lives. It is not just uh, being in full-time education. In regarding mental health, we also found some evidence of a mental health or ethnic mental health paradox that it is in particular white young people who were most affected or who were more likely to report uh, mental health problems compared to ethnic minority young people. And then I want to talk now about risk and protection, i.e. what can be done to support young people. So while risk factors generally increase the probability of experiencing harm, protective factors instigate processes that alter the effects of risk or adversity on the outcomes. And generally, negative outcomes are more likely uh, where the risk factors outweigh the protective factors and uh, resilience interventions, i.e. interventions trying to promote well-being and adjustment even in the face of adversity, that they focus either on increasing the amount of the protective factors and also to reduce uh, the risk impact, i.e. the factors that cause the uh, harm in the first place. And in addressing uh, what, how to support young people, um, in my own research, I'm very much informed by the socio-ecological systems model, which was developed by Ponfenpenner, and it uh, highlights actually that individual lives are always embedded in a wider system of family and uh, context within the neighborhood and communities, and um, where you are, uh, there is as well as the macroeconomic system or the wider sociocultural system. And it is this constant exchange between the different levels of influence that shape individual life and experience. And you cannot understand individual adjustment without taking into account this wider um, social and cultural context in young people's lives. And regarding the potential factors or resilience factors that can support uh, young people in their development. Um, there is a, a famous short list of resilience factors which have shown to be which have shown to have beneficial effects across a range of situations and risk factors, including economic risk factors such as the threat of unemployment or poverty, but also other threats such as, um, for example, growing up uh, in a household where um, you are exposed to, let's say, parents with mental health problems or um, drug abuse and uh, disadvantaging neighborhoods, overcrowding and so on. So these are the resilience factors that matter across situations and across uh, cultures and countries. And, and so while there are a number of individual level characteristics such as problem solving skills, self-control and emotion regulation, as well as behavior regulation, motivation and agency, i.e. to be uh, planful and active and having a sense of self-efficacy or sense of purpose, as well as hope and optimism for the future, all these characteristics have shown to have beneficial effects uh, in, uh, in counteracting um, the exposure to risk effects. But of course, individual characteristics or young people on their own <laughs> cannot uh, overcome all the challenges and perils evoked by the uh, pandemic and the ensuing economic crisis. They of course need the support of their uh, parents and family who however are also often uh, affected by this crisis, who struggle to make ends meet, who have lost their work, who might not have the uh, economic uh, or emotional resources to support their children. But of course families 
and the social networks of young people play such an important role, including the role of effective caregiving and parenting, characterized by warmth and consistency, close relationships with other capable adults, i.e. not necessarily family members, but they can be either neighbors or teachers or mentors within the community where young people are able to establish um, meaningful relationship and get guidance and support but of course also close friends and romantic partners are important as well as the characteristics of the wider community including effective and well-resourced school safe neighborhoods uh, where there are for example low rates of crime and where young people feel safe to uh, to go out and uh, also engage in their neighborhoods the community resources which includes particularly now access to green green spaces or parks but also of course uh, access to resources such as libraries health services which are all crucially important for young people as well as the cultural routines and festivities that mark certain events and create feelings of um, uh, of community belonging so in addition to your self-efficacy you also need some uh, collective uh, identity and collective uh, efficacy particularly in times of crisis and of course, I want to mention the employment opportunities because employment is such an important task of young people's lives. And to support their transition, it is important to create strong connections between education institutions and employers to smooth the transition from a school to work for young people, to create bridges between uh, what you learn in, in, in your educational institutions and what you then need in your work context. And that also means to boost in particular the quality and relevance of education and training. And if we learn from the 2008 uh, uh, recession, it was in particular uh, vocational training as for example offered in most of the German speaking countries where um, young people who had uh, high quality uh, uh, vocational training uh, and apprenticeships that enabled them a smooth transition into the labor market and here I want to highlight in particular also the potential of uh, degree apprenticeships which enable young people to combine work and learning for a degree, but generally work-based learning is a crucial stepping stone for young people to make it into the labor market. I mean, it is very difficult to create opportunities now that the labor market is crashing down, but young people should not be the last in line. They should be considered first. They are the future for all of us. And so I think there is such important role to boost the quality and relevance of education and training and to create viable employment and training opportunities, which lead to career prospects in the future. And that also includes that young people are adequately paid for the jobs they do, that they do get a living wage that enables them to become independent. And of course, uh, contracts that uh, include social protection and unemployment insurance, i.e. Uh, to uh, reverse this movement toward precarious employment and temporary employment only. But also there should be remedial interventions to help young people after they leave education or uh, that is active labor market initiatives to support those uh, struggling to find employment. Uh, for example, there is uh, employment and training guaranteed, which is offered, but how can it be implemented and monitored now in um, in um, the time of a crisis, there should be uh, appropriate um, career guidance and information about uh, what to study, how to study, for example, but also support for lifelong learning, i.e. Uh, creating opportunities for those who left education to return to education or to upskill at later stages, which mean there should be investments in the digitalization and uh, investment in online resources to make it possible for young people to uh, participate in education and training to get degrees even in this time where we have um, the social distancing and it is not possible often to um, 
engage uh, in face-to-face -face, uh, contacts or teaching. And of course, it should also include uh, access uh, to mental health services for young people and not a reduction of these places. So it needs this um, serious investment in support, not only for employment opportunities, but also mental health services. So what we need is a joined up system, a support system, which is particularly suitable for young people and uh, that can help to um, uh, provide a scaffolding for young people to make it into the employment uh, and labor market and to establish viable careers and to be able to <laughs> support the future generations to come. And I think this is um, all I wanted to say, I want to acknowledge the contributions and collaborations with all of my colleagues, but also our latest, um, um, the year funded project by the ESRC on youth economic activity and health. And here you find some references where uh, some of the findings are written up. And of course, we are currently in preparation of new papers. And so I want to thank you for your attention. And hopefully we can find the means to support the education, employment, and also the mental health of young people and not, uh, and not forget about them. Thank you. <clears throat> and I think I stopped this. Thank you. Bye-bye.